And if that orchestra is syncing with what you're doing, then you're fine if it is in sync with that. But if you're doing some disruptive activities, for example, you're watching a television at 11 o'clock in the night, and you're looking at that glaring screen which is emanating blue light, and that light falls onto your retina and it tells that, oh, it's still daylight out there, so we don't have to secrete the melatonin, which it should have secreted at around 9 o'clock, and then you're not able to sleep because you're not able to sleep, that's why you're watching more and more television late in the night. By the time you go to sleep and then it starts secreting melatonin, it is still into your system till 9 o'clock in the morning and you're waking up very dull, heavy, groggy and you're not having any energy to do anything. If you would have turned off the television at 8 o'clock in the evening and turn off the light and make your bedroom completely dark, the melatonin secretion will start and you will be able to sleep between 10 to 4 in the morning and very easily waking up around 5 to 6 in the morning. So I actually designed a program totally based upon Ayurvedic understanding of how to live in accordance with the laws of nature. So this is a perfect ten, uh, template to really understand and the clock genes is a good model and this model is in everything. We talk about how the animals and species and plant respond to the change of season, the gene variation. Just to give you an example, in, in the United States, we, we move the clocks in different time zones, so we do the clock changes. Every time we spring forward one hour clock change in March, April, there's 10% increase of heart attacks, myocardial infarctions. 10% increase just because you increase the time by one hour. So our body is able to change the time and every time, imagine you're flying cross country and there's two, three hours of jet lag and uh, changes that are happening. Your bowel movements, your digestion, your appetite, your sleep habits, everything gets shifted and changed. And many of you guys who are working here late night are literally having daily jet lag. You're experiencing what we call it as social jet lag on an everyday basis. So chronobiology is fairly hardwired. You can't change it. You cannot change it. And that's the reason we'll talk about it. So. Yeah, change your schedule, change your life is the name of the book. Is the name of the book, so... Uh, it was too long to fit in the slide, so. So, rhythms of nature. This is nothing new to Ayurveda. This is exactly what we're talking about. The body needs to cleanse, purify, every day. Sleep is the most potent cleansing activity that you will ever do in your life. Daily self-renewal, harmonizing your internal rhythms. Nature moves in the cycles. So, we all know that the circadian rhythms, the seasonal rhythms, the lunar rhythms, the tidal rhythm, how the tides are changing. Means the whole Vedic calendar is based upon that. Is that right? We don't follow the solar Gregorian calendar. We follow the lunar calendar. You talk about Krishna Paksha, you talk about Shukla Paksha, you talk about Pratipada, Trayodashi, Chaturdashi. These are all tidal rhythms. You know exactly how your mind is going to behave on a given day because that's where the moon is transiting. Chandrama Manaso Jataha is the significator of the mind from a Vedic perspective. Your moods and emotions, which is correlating with hypothalamus, are affected constantly with the rhythms of moon. You talk about celestial rhythms of the planetary cycles, so there's a basis of understanding of the planetary moments from an astronomical purposes, not about future telling or Jyotish predictions or anything, just from an astronomical purposes, this is exactly what the science has created. Phenomenal. And everything based upon this, Ritu Sandhi, Rajokala, Ratri Charya, Dinacharya, these are all expressions. And the Vedic calendar is based upon time, meeting the time and taking your life to timelessness. Deepak wrote a book earlier called as Ageless Body, Timeless Mind. And we use this term for referring our gods and deities and things like that, isn't it? Trigunatit, Trikalatit, those are the terms that we use. That's beyond time, beyond space and time. And when we talk about measurement of time, the word measurement of the time is what Maya is all about. Maya literally means measurement. 
So our little planet Earth is swirling on its axis and it's moving around the sun at a dizzying speed. And whether you like it or not, the day and night are created. Whether you like it or not, your cellular functions are totally dependent upon that. So you are blessed and cursed with the day and the night if you are living on planet Earth. And they figured out a way to live in accordance with making sure that you measure the time properly and you create a conducive lifestyle in all the ancient cultures and religions in the world. All the festivals and everything falls according to lunar calendars. The food comes to you at different times of the year. Is that right? The food in Adan Kala is different. What you eat in Visarga Kala is different. It's, it's a phenomenal science to respect the time and go beyond time to make sure that you are perfectly synchronized with your individual rhythms, with cosmic rhythms. In modern medicine, we call it as entrainment and synchronizations of the rhythms, bodily rhythms, with what the nature is trying to do. Even these months that you talk about, it's all about lunar calendar, isn't it? You talk about Shad Ritus and Ritu Charyas. It's about when the full moon is happening on which nakshatra. That's the Ritu that you're talking about. So the very basis of the accumulation of the doshas, the aggravation, the, the localization, totally based upon this science, it's a time-related science. It's a time-bound science where you need to understand the rhythms and the rituals, what you're doing. And this is the science of latest science of chronobiology that is very fascinating. Because if you look at 6 o'clock, around 6.45, 6.30 in the morning is the sharpest rise in your blood pressure. It's the peak time of your cortisol that is secreting at that time. So around 7 o'clock in the morning, between 7 to 9, is the time when people die the most. All causes of mortality happens between 7 to 9 a.m. all around the world. Because that is the time when the things are, the, the cortisol is rising. It's very, very high paced. If, imagine you go for a morning walk around that time. Imagine you are doing your meditation. Imagine you are doing your puja. Imagine you are doing some, uh, your abhyanga, you are doing some self-referral activities. That is when you are going to prevent the onslaught of this. So this is the sharpest rise of blood pressure. The melatonin secretion stops around 7 o'clock. Your brain is at its highest alertness from 8.30 in the morning till 12.30. 8.30 to 12.30, your brain is fully awake. It can carry out everything that you want to really task your brain between 8.30 and 12.30. 12.30 is the peak time for your digestive juices and secretions to happen around that time. And that's the main time for calorie intake. It's called as solar eating patterns. And now there are books which are written about it. Eat only when it is light out there. Those are the books that are coming out. You should be eating only between 9 to 7. And if you are able to do that, whatever you want to eat, eat between 9 to 7 only. It's totally based upon, that's called as chrononutrition. It's about nutrition according to the time. So that's when you are able to digest the time. The best coordination of your activity is around 2.30, 3 o'clock. Your body to do physical activity and movement is the fastest reaction time is around 3.30 in the afternoon. Your ability to do cardiovascular efficiency, strength training, physical workout, exercise is good around 5.30 or 6. But there are these workout places which are open 24 hours and they are terrible. So again in the evening, highest rise of blood pressure. That happens around that time. The body temperature rises around that time, the cholesterol synthesis is happening, the immune system activities are happening in the night, free radical scavenging, you name it. We were thinking sleep is when you don't have anything else to do, that's when you go to sleep. But I think sleep is a miracle drug. There is nothing that any drug can accomplish what a good night's sleep can accomplish. So the melatonin starts secreting around that time and when you look at all the activities that are happening, what the body is trying to do. The WBC white blood cells scavenging the immune system activity happens at the midnight. Growth hormone, lymphocytes, 
um, prolactin, secretions, ACTH, FSH, growth hormones, LH, they are all regulated in the middle of the night. The neuroendocrinological chemistry and biochemical reactions happen around that time. The cortisol surge, the catecholamine surge, happens around 6 o'clock. People die around that time because of acute cardiac arrest. Blood pressure, heart rate increases. The platelets are very sticky around 8 o'clock in the morning. The platelet adhesiveness, angiotensin activity, which actually creates more inflammatory occlusion. The blood is very viscous. The hemoglobin synthesis, airway patency happens around 5 o'clock in the evening. The cholesterol synthesis is regulated around 8 o'clock. So you want to make sure that your evening meal is super light because you don't want to really inhibit the cholesterol and the lipid synthesis at that time. And if you look at the diseases that happen, they're exactly happening around the same time. The gout attacks happen at midnight. Gallbladder attacks happens around 1 o'clock in the night. GERD peptic ulcer attacks happen at that time. Dr. Lele is a surgeon, so he would know when he has to wake up in the middle of the night to do some of these surgeries because that's when people actually go to um, emergency room. Around 2 o'clock in the night is the congestive heart failure, cardiogenic pulmonary episodes, cluster migraine headache. People wake up with headache around 4 o'clock in the morning. Asthmatic attacks are at its peak around 5 o'clock in the morning. Death, all causes, happens around 7 o'clock. The depression is at its worst in the morning. Allergic rhinitis, cold, flu, rheumatoid arthritis, morning stiffness that we talk about. Angina pectoris, sudden cardiac death, stroke, all of that happens around 8, 9 o'clock in the morning. So it's such an important junction time. We talk about dawn and dusk. Is that right? dawn and dusk, which are the times when the night is ending and the day is coming, and when the day is ending and the night is setting in, that one or two hours is the time for yourself. Whatever you do for yourself is the most important time of the day to prevent all of these things. In the middle of the day, one o'clock, stomach ulcer perforation, tension, headache onset happens, four o'clock in the afternoon, intestinal ulcer perforation, the osteoarthritic changes are really bad, five or six p.m. in the evening. The cholesterol synthesis is highly elevated, backache around 8 o'clock, restless legs, hot flashes. So if you look at all of these symptoms and all the physiological activities and put the Ayurvedic dosha clock on top of that, it fits like hand and glove perfectly. You look at the doshas, their doshic behavior and activities that is happening in the night, it exactly functions. You talk about uh, the activities that you should be doing, everything that you should be thinking, in what time of the day. The swastha vritta, the way we learn, is optimal daily routine and ideal daily routine is a chronobiological factor which is being respected now. What we are learning in modern medicine, it's not what you eat. When you eat is more important. It's not how much sleep you get, but when you sleep is more important. It's not how much exercise you get, but when you exercise is more important. So the timing of when was never paid attention to. It was always what and why, but now it's all about when. Because when is all about circadian regulation and rhythms, seasonal cycles, talking about ritus and having a proper time, the cycles of life that we talk about, eating right, eating the right food at the right time, that's the key. Intermittent fasting, we have talked about upavasa for ages together, and the buzzword that comes out about intermittent fasting, means I think Ayurveda is, is the science that has talked about stop eating any food after sunset, is that right? And if you're able to stop eating after seven o'clock in the evening and not eat till eight o'clock in the morning, that's the reason why we call it as breaking the fast. It's a 13-hour fasting every night. It's one of the greatest predictors. Food is overrated. Those people who eat less live longer. What you need is air to live. The second most important is water and very little food. We have made it very, very complicated unnecessarily. The less you eat, the healthier and happier you will become. I think there is enough research that is coming out where fasting regulates the genetic behavior and it actually turns off a lot of unhealthy genes. A lot of unhealthy genes are regulated by just fasting. The whole ketogenic diet that everybody is talking about, if you do it properly, can be very effective. 
can be very effective. So I think Ayurveda is the very basis, is the root source, is the Gangotri of everything that we are talking about as buzzwords in medicine. Circadian disruptions leads to weight gain. If you're following it, your time is embedded in your genes. 13 hour fasting every night, sleep is the miracle drug as I said. Eat late to gain some weight and sleep late to gain some weight. Trust me, 70% of the country does both. This is the prescription for weight gain, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, you name it, you can have it. Eat late to gain some weight, sleep late to gain some weight. And I teach with some eminent scientists in the countries. I go to national television shows, talk shows in the country, talking about Ayurveda in very scientific terms. Every little concept of Ayurveda that I'm going to share is validated by effective research. And morning workout was one thing which I mentioned in my book, where if you do a 30 minutes vigorous, can someone tell me the time, if you, whenever you are, okay? So I love to talk so I can go on forever, so. Um, if you are able to do 30 minutes of vigorous physical exercise before your breakfast in the morning, it prevents type 2 diabetes by 46%. It prevents having heart disease by 49%. We should be putting billboards about this because there's no drug that is going to do this much effective control of anything that you talk about. So, it's boiling down to the tripod that Ayurveda has talked about in diet, sleep and exercise. If you're eating good food and good diet, that will give you enough energy to do physical exercise and movement. If you're pleasantly tired, you're able to fall asleep and stay asleep. So, it feeds on each other. So, your diet will affect your sleep, your sleep will affect your energy and exercise pattern and behavior. Jet lag, social lag, we talk about morning workout is a metabolic reset. And this is what we have known forever, isn't it? Arogyam bhaskarati chet. Mindful uh, interoceptive awareness. This is a technical medical term. For you to be aware what is going on in your body is called as interoceptive awareness. At a visceral level, your blood pressure, your heartbeats, your respiratory rate can be regulated and modulated by a mindful awareness techniques slowing down the pace of life and I jokingly tell my patients for a fast acting relief, try slowing down. And there are, there are needs, there are human needs that we always talk about. Means people ask me that, oh, we went to India and there are people living in slums and jopatpatis and things and do they follow all these things? And there are some basic human needs, physiological needs, which is need to satisfy hunger and thirst. So that is the lowest spectrum of everything. Once those are met, you are happy with that, then you start worrying about the safety needs, whether you need to feel that the world is organized and predictable, and then you are worried about that to make sure everything is organized. Once that is taken care of, you have a nice house paid off, you are living in a good, decent household and situation, then you find some belongingness and love then you start craving that people should love you, respect you, they should respond to you, you should be loved and things like that, and being accepted to avoid loneliness and alienation. Once that is met, then you want to go for esteem needs. That people should recognize you, you should become famous, your achievement, competence, independence, respect from others, and once you have name, fame and money, then you go for spiritual quest, is that right? Then you go for self-actualization. So these are basic human needs. And the reason why I'm showing this because my next book on Vedic counseling was totally based upon meeting human needs, where everybody's needs are basically four A's. You talk about affection, attention, appreciation, and acceptance. Every one of us wants those. And if you're not giving it to your patients, through your psycho-emotional counseling, you're missing the bus. Because this is what the treatment is all about. Is that right? So the template of Vedic counseling is meeting people where they are and slowly leading them where they need to be. 
All of these books are available on Amazon. Feel free to order them wherever you can find them. I think Vedic counseling is total integration of Ayurveda, Yoga, Vedanta, and so many other spiritual modalities that we have. All the darshanas is the basis of Ayurveda itself. We study that in our schools in Padartha Vidyan for the year, but we never practice those. And it's high time to really go back and integrate all of those things together. It's going back to really understanding that what's the core basis of spiritual living. And we can define Vedic counseling as dharmic guidance, right living, right action, right awareness. And we are trying to become not only Ayurvedic physician, but Vedic counselor and a guide. Because you can integrate all of these things together, life on a spectrum scale from point A to point B. You can use Ayurveda, you can use yoga, you can use Jyotish, Vastu, Vedanta. You don't have to be a super specialist of everything. You just need to know some very basic fundamentals of all of those and integrate them. Because Ayurveda is still very mystical. It is still a science that people love to really learn more about it. There's something for everyone. And you really need to understand how to present it, how to talk about it, and how to use it in your clinical practice itself. And I think the book talks about a template. It's a guide for yoga teachers, instructors, Ayurvedic practitioners, therapists. It's all about self-knowledge, knowing yourself, who you are, what you want, why do you eat certain things, how you process your emotions. That self-knowledge leads to self-discovery and that self-discovery leads to self-healing and creating a very spiritual outlook. Because at the end of the day, we all want to be happy. The science of happiness is way beyond just feeling healthy. It's about health, healing yourself, and finding non-sensorial happiness is the human quest. And we cannot outsource that to any guru or spiritual teacher that you go to someone else and they will tell you. I think it's high time that we need to integrate that in our own clinical practice so that we become a part of how people learn from us and slowly integrate those things in their thinking, in their living, in their behavior. Job satisfaction, satisfaction in their marriages and relationship, any life challenges that you have, your ability to counsel them and guide them is very, very important. And nobody teaches us how to do counseling. Nobody teaches us psychology. We don't want to talk about psychiatry. It's all about psycho-emotional counseling. So this is a template that I use in my practice that change your perception and you will change everything that you weigh, you ingest. We use the word ahara, is that right? Ahara means to ingest, to take in. So you need to change your perception and the way you will ingest the experience will change also. And not only you need to do that, you need to help our patients and clients to do that. Try to expand our awareness and be mindful. Try to live as much as possible. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, Yukta ahar viharasya yukta cheshtasya karmasu. Yukta svapna bodhasya yoga bhavati dukkha. As simple as that. Eat the right food at the right time, go to bed at a proper time, do the right activities at the right time. That's the yoga of life. Alleviating all causes of suffering, as simple as that. It's a prescription for everyone. And that's what we're talking about here. It has to be so simple and easy. Eating consciously, eating light and pure foods, regular exercise, fit body, we can talk volumes about it. Okay, physical movement, it's a very underutilized healing modality, very underutilized. Fasting, physical movement, exercise, eliminating toxicity, detoxification, purging, getting rid of ama, cultivating flexibility, learning to forgive people, letting go of things, not carrying the grudge for a very, very long time into your system. Listening to your body signals, be aware that you're able to listen to your own bodies, living in present. Because there's no past and future. It's an illusion anyway. Time is an illusion anyway. To worry about future or to worry about past, just keeping you busy, nothing else. Quietening the internal dialogue through meditation, through mindful walking, whatever you do. Relinquish the need for external approval. Who says what to you doesn't really mean anything. What they think of you is none of your business. It is something that you can get stuck to this situation for a very long time. 
The world out there reflects your reality in here, shedding the burden of judgment, making sure you're respecting the plan of nature, just trying to go with the flow, be as patient as possible, flexibility, resilience, to bounce back from difficult, traumatic situations in life. And I think diseases, and currently I'm working on a, on a very interesting project, which is all about um, um, using Ayurveda and Ayurvedic practitioners to do psycho-emotional counseling for breast cancer survivors. Because these women have lost their breast, have no hair, and their body image has changed completely. They become so depressed because a big part of their life has gone. And we are creating a template based upon Ayurveda to actually help them, counsel them that how they can, they are alone, they are still alive. They, can, they have to rekindle the aspiration and joy for looking at life differently. When you have a coronary bypass and now you, you are following certain diet, you can't really do all the good or bad things that you were doing, you need a lot of emotional support and counseling to do that. So there are lots of hospitals which are allowing these counselors, which are Ayurvedic practitioners, to help people to actually counsel in these difficult situations using the same templates that we are talking about. So resilience is, is again a buzzword for PTSD, for post-traumatic stress disorders. And I think Achar Rasayana is, is a fabulous template, fabulous template. We need to decode every word and write a book about each one of them. Each word, Satyavadina Makrodham. You can take each word and look at that and explain everything. Making people feel important. Respect them, they'll respect you. Give them love, they will love you. Is that right? Give others what you want and you will get it. So making people feel important, loved, valued, respected, appreciated. Finding your passion, love what you do and do what you really like to do. So whether it's Ayurvedic practice or anything else, finding your own passion and purpose within your own core practice, following the inspiration, contributing something bigger, greater than yourself. 